Today I'm going to show you a design pattern that I think is underrated. It's called the template method. It's really nice. I recently kind of rediscovered it and started using it more. I have an interesting example for you this time. Everybody's talking about Bitcoin and the stock is moving faster than a Tesla Model S in ludicrous mode. So I'm going to use a trading bot as an example. I'll show you how you can use the template method design pattern to improve the code. And then I'll show you another pattern, the bridge that takes this example to the next level. So let's get started. The core of this example is the check prices method that for a certain coin gets the price information and determines whether you should buy or sell something of that coin. It starts with connecting with the exchange, then it gets price data for that particular coin, then it determines whether it should buy or sell given that price data, and then it prints out a status message. Now normally this would be the point where you would place orders and things like that. Each of these methods is in the application class. And for the moment, they're mostly dummy methods, like the connecting method, for example, just prints out a message. Getting market data just returns a couple of numbers. Obviously, normally this would be API calls. When you create an instance of this application, you also provide a trading strategy. Default, this is average, but another option is min-max. Both of these strategies are actually pretty bad, so really please, if you are into trading, just don't use these, but they're purely serving as an example. In the should buy and should sell method, then depending on that trading strategy, we use a different algorithm to determine whether we should buy something or whether we should sell something. With the min-max strategy, you will only buy when the price is lower than all of the previous prices. And with the average strategy, you will only buy if the price is lower than the average of the last few prices. And should sell is the other way around. So finally, in this example, I create an instance of the application and then I check the prices for a particular kind of cryptocurrency. And if I run this, then you get this kind of result. So sell Bitcoin. I'm not saying you should sell Bitcoin, by the way. Maybe you should buy Bitcoin. If I take another strategy here and then I run the application again, I get a different result for Bitcoin because the buying and selling strategy is different. Let's analyze this example. The application class has lots of responsibilities. It's responsible for connecting with the exchange, getting the data, determining whether you should buy or sell and what those specific algorithms are. And it's also responsible for the overall process of what a trading bot should do. So that's a lot of different things. And ideally when you design software, you want to avoid that a class has this many different responsibilities. Now what you could do is use a strategy pattern for each of the steps in the process. So for example, you could use a strategy for whether you should buy and another strategy for whether you should sell. And then perhaps here, replace this also by different strategies depending on the action that you want to take. That leads to a lot of extra classes because every strategy basically means you have to introduce a class, abstract class, and then you have to add subclasses for each of the different strategies. So that leads to a lot of boilerplate. Another nice design pattern that you could use for this is the so-called template method. What the template method does is that it helps you standardize a process. So it's in particular suitable for things where you have a fixed process, but the steps in the process may be different. For example, if you have a web shop, the order flow is going to be pretty standardized. A customer places an order, you have to handle the order, then you have to go to logistics, send the order out, uh, and then there is a return item process and so on. So this is kind of a fixed process that's happening. But the steps may be different because for uh, digital products, you may have to send an email instead of sending it via uh, the regular mail. Physical products may be sent by different logistics partners. That means the process is the same for the order flow, but the steps in the process may be different depending on the type of product or the situation. Another example is customer support ticket handling. There's also a standardized process of a ticket that comes in, that's assigned to somebody, that somebody deals with it. But also there, the steps might be different. For example, in some cases, a support ticket may require a physical visit to the customer's base of operations to fix something. And otherwise, a phone call or an email is enough. This is what the template method does. You have a standard process, but the steps are different. Here's a class diagram of what it looks like. A trading bot is also a good example of where you can apply the template method because the process is always the same. You check prices, you check what you should buy, you check what you should sell. Then you take the steps to actually buy or sell something. But 
the strategy you use for buying or selling might be different. So let's change the example that we have here and use the template method design pattern to improve the way that the code is structured. As a first step, let's create a trading bot that contains the overall check prices, process method, and then abstract methods for the different parts of this process. So first I'm going to import the abstract base class, which obviously is what we're going to need for this. And then let's create a trading bot class. The trading bot class is going to contain the main methods that are currently in application. So for now, I'm just going to copy these over and then we're going to restructure them later. So instead of explicitly modeling methods like should buy and should sell, we're going to make those abstract so that we can create subclasses that perform a particular version of this step that we would like to have. So I'm going to remove all this code here. And I'm going to turn this should buy and should sell methods into abstract methods. And actually now that should buy and should sell are abstract, we don't need this list average method here anymore because it belongs to a particular version of should buy and should sell. So I can remove it from this class actually. The next step is that we will create trading bots that follow specific versions of this process. For now, I'm just going to ignore the connect to an exchange and getting market data from an exchange. I'll do something different with that a little bit later. So let's focus for now on the should buy and should sell steps in the process. So for that, I'm going to create different classes depending on the type of strategy I would like my trading bot to follow. Let's first create an average trader that takes the average of the prices and determines based on that if you want to buy or sell. Now that I'm following the template method design pattern, I should make a subclass of my trading bot that I created a few minutes ago. The only thing I need to do here is provide the actual implementations for the should buy and should sell methods. Here I'm going to need this list average function. I'm just going to copy it over to this class. And then I'll copy over the code needed for determining whether we should buy or sell. There you go. And in a similar way, I can create a trader for the min-max strategy. Should remove this abstract method call, obviously. Now we have an average trader, which uses the average of the prices, and we have a min-max trader that uses the minimum and maximum of the prices. What's really nice now is that we've decoupled the process, which is checking prices and determining whether you should buy or sell, from the actual algorithms or strategies needed to buy or sell. Now let me just remove this class here because we don't need it anymore. And then what we're going to do is we're going to create a min-max trader and then we're going to check the prices and you get this result. If I want a different trading strategy, I use the average trader. What's really nice now is I can add extra trading bot classes here without actually having to do anything in the original check prices method. This works completely independently from the steps in the process that I'm going through. So here you see very clearly that the process is completely standardized, but you can change the steps without adding too much boilerplate code. There's one more thing I'm going to do with this example, and that's I'm going to introduce a second design pattern to make it even better. The problem is that currently in TradingBot, we have also methods for things that a trading bot should not really do, such as connecting to an exchange or getting market data from an exchange. That's something that doesn't belong here, that should be something else. What we're gonna do is use another pattern called the bridge to solve this problem. The bridge is a really nice pattern. Uh, you don't see it used that much, but it's actually really cool if you can incorporate it in your design. The thing that the bridge solves for you is if you have two separate things that vary. Uh, in this case, you have exchanges, you may use different exchanges, and you have different trading bots. And what the bridge solves for you 
is that it gives you the capability of adding an extra exchange or adding an extra trading bot without having to do anything on the other side of the bridge. So the bridge is kind of a mechanism to have two separate class hierarchies, two variations that can change independently from each other. And that's really nice because obviously if we want to add another exchange to our example program, let's say we started with Binance, but now we also want to add Coinbase or uh, Bitfinex or whatever, we don't want to have to change anything in our trading bots. We simply want to add an extra exchange class and we want the system to be able to work with that. And similarly, if we think of a new trading strategy, we don't want to have to change things over at the different types of exchanges that we're using because that has nothing to do with the trading algorithm. This is a class diagram of the bridge pattern. It looks a bit complicated, but it will be clear to you once we start implementing it in the example. The main thing that we need to do is create a separate hierarchy of classes for the different exchanges. So I'm going to create an exchange abstract class. And for now, that class has just a few methods, one for connecting to the exchange and one for getting the market data. Normally you'd have lots of different methods here for getting prices, volume, uh, placing orders, and so on and so on. But obviously in this example, we're not going to deal with all of those things. So in essence, in this example, there are only two methods, which is connect and getting market data. And because these are abstract, I'm just gonna write pass here. Instead of trading bot having these two methods, trading bot should now have a reference to a particular exchange. Like so, and let's add the exchange type hint information here to make clear that this is actually something of type exchange. So trading bot has an exchange. And then in the check prices method, I'm using that exchange to get the data that I need. The bridge in this example is this connection here. It's the connection between the trading bot object and the exchange object. And the interesting thing here is that this connection happens completely on the abstract level. So you can't make exchange instances because it's an abstract class. You can't make trading bot instance because it's also an abstract class, but trading bot has an exchange. And that means we now have a structure where we can have different types of exchanges and different types of trading bots on the other end, and they can vary independently from each other. And that's the power of the bridge pattern. Let's add a few sample exchanges to show how it works. So first I'm going to make a Binance exchange. And this is a subclass of the abstract exchange class. And the only thing I need to do here is implement the connect and get market data method. Again, I'm just putting in some random numbers here. So this is the Binance exchange. Let's make a second one, Coinbase. And we're going to change the numbers here so we can also see a few different results. There. So I have two exchanges, I have two trading bots. And when I create the trader, the trading bot, I need to provide the exchange. Let's start with Coinbase. And then we get this, connected to Coinbase, you should sell Bitcoin US dollar. If I want to change the exchange that I'm using, I can simply provide a different object here. And apparently, according to both Binance and Coinbase, I should sell Bitcoin. If I'm using the Minmax trader, I can also use that and change it here without having to do anything on, with the exchange. So here I have the Minmax. According to Minmax, we shouldn't need to do anything. And I can change this to Coinbase. And Coinbase has a slightly different prices, so there we should actually sell Bitcoin. But this shows exactly the power of the bridge pattern. We can change what this object is, we can change what that object is, and we don't have to make any changes in the actual 
classes here because the bridge pattern solved that problem for us. And the trading bot in turn uses the template method design pattern. So the process of what a trading bot should do is standardized, but the steps in the process can be changed by the different subclasses. So what I've shown today is actually something that you will see quite commonly, is that you will never just use a single design pattern, but you will use them together. And by combining these design patterns to cover various aspects of your application, in the end, it's gonna help you a lot with writing code with much better coupling and cohesion. If you look at this example, you see that the trading bot now purely deals with the process. So that's just one responsibility, which is really nice. We have the exchange that's purely dealing with connecting with the exchange and doing the jobs there that you need to do. And the way that it's combined is also with very low coupling because the trading bot is not dependent on implementation details of specific exchanges such as Binance or Coinbase. You've just seen an example where I applied two design patterns to improve the code of a trading bot. There's a caveat though, don't use that code directly to start trading cryptocurrencies. You're gonna lose a lot of money, trust me, I've been there. I noticed that there is some resistance in the Python community on using design patterns. I don't really know why that is. Perhaps it's post-traumatic stress syndrome from when you had to learn design patterns in your studies. Or perhaps you're just using Python to write very simple scripts. I still think though that things like design patterns and principles and software design in general is really important. If you're a painter, you also care about quality brushes and quality paints so you can make nice paintings. As a software developer, if you want to improve your craft, you need to learn about these design patterns and design principles and apply them rigorously to your code so you can deliver a quality product in the end. I'd say even if you're writing smaller scripts, it's never too early to start thinking about software design so you can reuse the code later on in a much easier way. Anyway, the code that I showed today in the trading bot example is in the GitHub repository. There's a link in the description below. If you're enjoying this series, consider subscribing and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new content that I publish. Thanks for watching, take care and see you in the next video.